please do stay on. We, we do have time. Um, we wanted to have more of our critical conversation and learn more about Lene's research and some of the social justice issues that she's most passionate right about now um, and get deeper into the conversation. But if you have to drop off, we absolutely understand. I think a few folks have already um, have left, but it looks like most of us are still here, uh, ready to keep going. So handing it back over to you, Monet. One, I just wanted to say thank you all so much for coming. I see so many familiar faces. You all are so beautiful. Like I, I feel like I'm, I'm miss seeing you all. I look at my homegirl Lauren. Her hair is growing. Oh my goodness, it looks so beautiful. And Kelly, who lives down the street from me, whose thing I need to return. <laughs> it's good to see her too. And Nana who I think one of the last times I saw was in Columbia Heights in Washington, DC with her, her beautiful children um, leaving church. And that building is now an apartment complex um, in DC, um, sadly. Painful, um, painful topic. <laughs> painful. Um, because that church used to be a black church and that church was where I went to go vote when I um, lived in DC, actually. And yep. uh, the beautiful church, black church beautiful and the, the church ended up moving out to Maryland um, and this happened there was an earthquake in DC in I think August of 2011 and, yeah. and, and so the church sustained some damage and they didn't have I think they had already had a satellite out in Maryland which is um, a suburb of, of Washington DC and so I think that they just ended up a developer eventually and um you know doing that so it's it is a story i think when we talk about cooking in particular in, in black cooking you know we're talking about migration we're talking about forced movement we're talking about um ingredients that came from our labor a really essential part of this uh recipe is sugar right and so if we know anything about sugar um it was brought so i was reading a thing and it said that sugar was brought to the united states in 1619 um sugar cane was brought here in 1619 by uh colonizers and and they call they're called colonists but they're colonizers and it was um and so we also what we also know about 1619 is that 1619 was also when african-american bodies were brought to this country as enslaved people so we have sugar that the world has an appetite for at this point. And um, we have black bodies who are also brought here to make that um, sugar and feed that appetite. Um, in a, I'm forgetting the name of the, ex, the whole exhibit, but it's called Sugar Baby. An artist here called Kara Walker took over the Domino factory in Brooklyn, which is now a development, now lofts and apartments, but they were about to demolish it. And it's, uh, it's uh, is it on the Hudson? I think it's on the Hudson. It sits across from Manhattan. And she made this giant sphinx out of sugar. And around the sphinx were these little children called sugar babies and she made them out of molasses. And this is, mind you, you know, this, this exhibit is a it's an exhibit um, that you could walk into the factory. So it's huge. So imagine a, a sugar factory. It still smelled like sugar. So this factory has been dormant for some, quite some time, decades, scores, and you could still smell the sugar. And the smell of sugar is actually like sugar being refined is not a pleasant one. It's it's burning, it's, it stinks. Um, and I remember when we would drive uh, to see my dad's um, parents, my grandmother, my grandmother Cooper in South Georgia in Waycross. Um, shout out to the cross as they call it. And you would go through um, lots of farmland and inevitably you would go past the chicken plants and the, the chicken farms and you would go past sugar cane, but you would go past the sugar factory at some point. And I would, it's, it's a smell that you just can't forget. It doesn't smell good. And that's how that place smelled. Like when we, I was standing in line to get in 
And when I went, it was in July. And New York in July, as if anybody's been in New York in July, it is hot. Um, it is hot. And I'm from Georgia and I like the heat and that was hot up in that place. There was no air conditioning in that space. So it's, it's pretty authentic, right? Because if I was working in a factory at the turn of the, the 19th century, I wouldn't have had air conditioning, right? Um, so it's hot. And these sugar babies where these little children hold, I think they're holding a thing, um, are melting and they're, they're brown and they're black. And surrounding them were white people taking pictures. And then these are just like tourists, people who are interested in the space. And it was like a, a jolt to my spirit um, because of what Kara Walker, was, the statement Kara Walker is also making, right? Like as an artist, she can't predict what people will do, but she had ideas I'm sure about how people would interact with this exhibit. And I remember one of the, the articles um, written, written about this space was about how black folks and white folks were showing up in the space and how the interactions with the exhibit were very different for different people because of our racialized experiences in this country that are historicized even if we don't admit it, right? And so um, it was this jolt and I started crying and I kind of like had to go off by myself. And there was this woman, this Asian American woman, like I was looking for another person of color in the space and she just saw me and she smiled and I smiled back and it was like my spirit calmed. Like she, she felt, I could tell that she felt this is, this might be, be imbuing something that's not there, but she just was, she just smiled and I didn't feel so alone. And she was gently walking through the space, which is, which is what I was trying to do. And, um, but uh, the name of the exhibit, cause it's called Sugar Baby, but there's another name is the name of the dish. There's a specific dish that people in the Regency period and beyond used to place sugar in. So it wasn't called a sugar dish or whatever we call it now. It had a very formal name. And what Carol Walker was trying to do was make a statement about sugar, about the enslaved people who made it, who made it grow, the people who manufactured it, um, about you know a heart disease that's caused by our consumption in part of sugar. Um, of people's wealth. So when we're watching things like Pride and Prejudice or Bridgerton, which I love and have issues with, we're also talking about people whose wealth was made possible by sugar, right? That in the Caribbean, this elsewhere, that black people were making and cutting sugar. And so one of the things I was really surprised by in my research is that even though sugarcane was brought to the States, in 1619 or, or the territories in 1619, the colonizers couldn't make it grow. And it was, a I mean, so it was a very new country, quote unquote. And that um, while sugar was being made elsewhere, um, you, the US was late to the colonizing game. And so um, islands that had sugar, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Hawaii, the Philippines were all places where sugar was made. And at the time of the civil war in the United States, we got half of our sugar from Cuba, half from Louisiana. So when you go into the archive and you're looking at, at just caña, which is the Spanish word for um, sugar uh, or, um, or cane, sorry, sugar cane, um, you'll see these, these huge pieces of cane, you'll see pe black people cutting it. And so after the, the war was over, which ended, ended kind of ended slavery. I mean, slavery didn't end until Juneteenth, um, almost a year later in Galveston, Texas. Um, slave owners in Cuba um, wanted to be compensated from Spain for each of the, the enslaved peoples that they freed. So while in the United States, I mean, when we talk about reparations, um, <laughs> Y'all didn't ask for this, but <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it. Because um, I'm so fascinated by this because part of this is also what I learned when I was doing some research about this. But um, uh, when the war was over, white slave owners wanted to be compensated, right? For the, the, the black people who could no longer um, who they could no longer own. And so reparations were given to white slave owners in the, in the United States um, in this kind of post-reconstruction space. 
but African Americans were never compensated. We never got the 40 acres and a mule. And so mm -hmm. in Cuba, um, they wanted compensation from Spain, from each of the slaves that they freed. Spain was like, no, nah, we ain't doing that. We not the United States. Mm -hmm. And people, some historians argue this led to the 10 years war. Um, so between Monet, just really quickly, I'm trying to um, link to those of our viewers or um, those of us that don't have as deep knowledge or history of African-American experiences, um, the history of it. I think particularly as someone who is a Sierra Leonean American and many African immigrants tend to disconnect from the African-American um, experience and particularly how much the legacy and the history of slavery has had in impacting African-American communities today. And so I think one of the things that even people in my family that are in the US say, you know, I, slavery was a long time ago. Why do people still talk about this today? You know, especially new people who come to the United States and they see um, the poverty and the constant disenfranchisement of what happens in African-American communities. Can you talk a little bit about what's your response to um, uh, those, I mean, we are all <laughs> descendants of slaves, but those who are immigrants to the US who come and seem to not quite connect or understand um, this legacy of slavery and why it's still so important today. And we see the impact of, of it today in 2020. Well, Evelyn, I think your question is so beautiful because what it asks us to do is for people who are who identify as African, so you can't come from the continent, maybe you were born there, maybe you are first or second generation American. I feel like what you're doing is putting Africans in dialogue with African Americans or, or Black folks who may have come over on the Middle Passage. And I feel like um, one of my best friends is Nigerian American. And I feel like in our dialogues, Adeze, um, and I feel like in our dialogues, like we've known each other since undergrad, we've we've learned so much from each other. And I've appreciated her in my life because, you know, her, how she comes into her history is, I mean, there's the Biafran War, which happened in, in Nigeria and, you know, really tore the country apart and caused trauma in people's lives and, and brought Nigerian immigrants to this country. But there's so much that I don't know, right, about, about West African history. And most African-Americans in this country came from West Africa during the, the, mm -hmm. the slave trade period. So um, I don't know how to begin answering, you know, some of that question, except to say that I just think that more dialogue between diasporic, Afri people who identify as black diasporically have to be had so that we can learn from each other. Um, we all have so many different histories, right? And um, in my conversations too with you, Evelyn, as someone who's been raised all over the Sub-Saharan Africa um, and the United States, you often talk about um, some of the differences in, in how you come into your blackness versus in the United States, some of the ways that that, that blackness, um, there were tensions around it um, because of the things that we were dealing with in this country. Not to say that, that you weren't having those experiences um, in Africa either. And I find like, you know, I'm so grateful for my friends who invite me to celebrations. I'm like, I remember a day they actually invited me to the wedding, uh, a wedding. I didn't know these people. And actually, this is a day, Adeze is married to Abun, so this is her now husband. He had asked her on a date to go to this wedding. Adeze asked me to go on the date with them. I was like, girl, like, this is, I don't know these people. Like, I'm just gonna show up to the wedding. Like, this feels real bootleg. This feels very much ashy. And um, and she was like, no, like, this is how we do. And I was just like, well, do I, I was like, well, I'm gonna get a gift. And she was like, nope, you don't need to bring anything. Don't do anything. So we go on this date slash wedding experience and it was so much fun. And it was, I mean, there was there were a ton of people there um, who didn't know the groom or the bride. <laughs> so I felt just right at home um, and we had great dialogue and danced and ate good food. And um, maybe that would happen at a black wedding but people would ask you, who are you with? And you might get it out if you're crashing a wedding, but here, <laughs> But it, but it felt very communal. 
right? Yeah. And so it made me wonder, you know, what in or in becoming American, what parts of our culture do we that that involve sharing, that involve, involve community, do we shed in order mm-hmm. to become American? And I think our baking and eating practices, our cooking and eating practices. Um, build community. Like, mm. I love me some Agusi and some Fufu. I love me some Red Red <laughs> from Ghana. Nigerians. Yes. <laughs> Real controversial, um, but I'm really a fan of Ghana Jalaf. I love the, the, the Oh, the, don't start the, now. Don't start. Don't start. <laughs> I'm, sorry, yes. I'm sorry, Victoria. Um, but I but I love Nigerian Jalaf. Like, I would eat it all, but like, I love Black Eyed Peas. Oh, Leona's is winning the prize now. <laughs> and I love Evelyn's soup. She made this, um, what was it? Like like spicy bitternut soup. I mean, like- no, I, my mom. You had the bitter leaf, bitas, bitter leaf soup for my mom. It was delicious. <laughs> um, it hemmed me up in such a way that I thought something was wrong with my, was wrong with me. And then I remembered I ate that spicy soup and I was like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> I can actually quote what you actually said after you ate the pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> so Monet, can you also talk a little bit about why your research is focused on queer girls of color? I mean, I feel like these are voices that particularly on the African continent, um, we don't hear much about the experiences of what life is like for the LGBTQAI communities and particularly adolescent girls and young girls, um, primarily their cultural barriers, but then also um, legalities as well, which would prevent um, these groups from speaking up about their experiences. But you know, what led you to this body of research and can you talk more about what are the experiences like for queer girls of color in the United States, which I believe your your research focuses on geographically? Well, that's such a good question. Well, one, I'm I'm queer, and um, and so while you don't have to be queer to work on this research, I think one thing that brings me to my to my research is is an identity that I have. I think another thing is is teaching Black and Brown queer kids in D.C., in Maryland, in um, not so much in Virginia, but definitely teaching queer students, queer self-identifying students, um, watching, you know, students come into their own, you know, in some really beautiful ways, like come into their queer trans identities um, in beautiful ways, but also ways that we as educators were not helping them with. And I, and I can include myself in that, um, that I was like looking for resources, like how do I support this student? Like, how do I um, like I want to introduce texts that talk about it, and so I was I was doing that in the latter part of my career, but I think I, I should have done a much better job, particularly when I first started teaching. And I think we emphasize race. We started to emphasize race very heavily as a part of culturally responsive teaching. Shout out to Gloria Ladson Billings, um, but Gloria Ladson Billings also talks about the educational debt, and I think the educational debt is intersectional. It's not just racial. It's also gender identity, it's also sexuality. And when you say queer girls of color, um, and I wanna be really specific, I'm interested in African-American and Latinx, um, you know, queer and trans girls and binary students, um, because the the research is, I mean, like I'm working on a, a paper right now, and there's maybe like four articles that I found specifically in the area of education that deal, that specifically um, attend to this population. And we also know that in the United States that the average lifespan of a Black trans woman is 35 years of age, right? So I'm 41, and that means that I've lived almost six to seven years longer than the, the, a Black trans woman. So this, this research is for my collaborators and with my collaborators, but it's also for straight people, right, who might be parents of queer and trans children. It's also for straight folks who may never date a or or um, or even have those friends, but it's this work is on all of us. So when we talk about racial justice, um, you know, we have to also be talking about gender identity. We also have to talk about sexuality. And if and I'm a Black girlhood scholar, a community I love and claim, but in Black girlhood studies, there's we're just not talking about it. We're mm-hmm. talking about we assume straightness, we assume heterocentricity, we assume um, binaries, and I think that's really dangerous to map onto these kids. I mean, because they're they're children, right? 
And at the same time, we also know the Georgetown Law Center, pause y'all. I don't know if you all are smelling the cinnamon and the sugar. <laughs> it smells really good. So let's pause. If we can just check on. Sure. Our I'm so glad you said that because I think my monkey bread is actually semi overdone to burnt. <laughs> I just pulled it out of the oven and it's like, uh, I'm not sure it's supposed to look like this, Monet. So I would love to see what your thoughts are about this monkey bread. You want it? Oh, it looks good, girl. Yes. So here's the other way of telling it's done. We didn't use yeast because yeast, I didn't use yeast on this one because yeast just makes the, the, prep time longer you can also use yeast which will make your your bread bigger and just more beautiful bigger and beautiful um but it's it's fine so a way you can tell if it's done is if when you peel one off it's it's bread so it shouldn't be chewy it should be like a bread or biscuit like consistency okay. so you want to try to do that Ev? okay i'm gonna try to I'm gonna just lauren you're done or you're just checking it Oh, you can throw that. Uh, I think it's done. I'll check it now just to be, make sure. Ooh. Hi, Lauren. I didn't realize. Hi, so mine is done, Ooh. but it's definitely more biscuit Ooh. texture than bread. It's okay. Oh. So yours is beautiful. Yours are larger. Wow. Yours, yours are large, Tamara. So can you take one off and peel it? You too, Ev. It's very buttery. Very. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ev. Okay, so so take one off and peel it. Mm. Oh, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Mine says it smells good. I think mine might be a little too salty. Mm, why do you say mm. that? I think maybe the salted butter, maybe. Okay. Well, it is decadent, decadent. Yes, and so you can also, like some people put bacon, you know, with this. So when you get, they get ready to cook it, they put bacon in. Some people mm. make it more savory bread so instead of dipping it in say cinnamon oh. and sugar they'll like do parmesan cheese and garlic and shallots and things like that so i've never made that kind of bread you know i like my bread sweet so um so that's what i tend to do but there's there's so many i, I mean like just doing research i was like yo there's so many ways to make this so at some point maybe i'll make something more savory but i really like the the monkey bread how about other Tamara, have you tasted yours? I drink mine. I with have. It's delicious. It tastes like um, it tastes like biscuit with a cinnamon sugar coating. Amazing. So like an American like American biscuit. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Because to me, biscuit is biscuit is a cookie, but obviously for as an American biscuit, it tastes like that with cinnamon coating. Nice. You know, the thing is, is if you really want to make some biscuits, you use shortening. Mm -hmm. um, so my other, my grandma Cooper, grandma Roseanne, she would use shortening and her biscuits were the best. I mean, like, I'm still trying to make her biscuits. And the story goes, uh, so the Coopers can tell some stories. And I'm really talking about my grandma, my daddy's side of the family. So I don't know if this is true or not. But they're, they're some amazing storytellers. And I think, but I do think this is true because towns are small and people know each other. But my grandmother was really good friends with Ray, Ray Charles's mother. And so when Ray Charles would go home, um, because Ray Charles lived just outside of Waycross, he would come over to my grandma's house and get biscuits. He'd be like, let me get those biscuits. And in the South, um, in particular, um, the breads that we make, so cornbread, biscuits, are a uh, dessert. So growing up, cornbread with uh, sugar cane syrup, with cane syrup, would be the dessert. That's what I was eating for, was the cornbread with the syrup. Or the biscuits you made in the morning would be the dessert, you know? Um, 
I mean, it's definitely just fluffy and decadent. Victoria, I see you chomping away over there. How did yours come out? Can we see? Very good. Can oh, we see? <laughs> just by <like> gone. <laughs> oh, no, it's good. Uh, oh, lovely. Oh, so pretty. The, the rose. Can we see it closer, Victoria? Yeah, hold it out to your camera. That looks oh, it's, beautiful. It's hot. Oh, that looks so pretty. That is so pretty. Candace, so we're minutes out. I just want to. Can also, can also slay. Candace, can I see yours? Yeah. Kelly, did you, did we see yours, Kelly? Mine's in a, one of those stonework things and it always takes a lot longer to cook. So I'm going to pull it out in the next five minutes or so. Oh, yeah, mine is still bubbling as well. Let's see if I oh. can show you guys. And this is yours is still. It's still marinating. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm really curious how the coconut milk turned out. So I, I'm non-dairy. So I'm really curious how that, how you, yeah, how you make that work. I just want to thank you so much, Monet. Thank you again for sharing so much with us, your personal story, your research, this recipe from your grandmother, your mother. Um, so excited to have the Coopers here.